Since work depends so much on forces, we're going to take a minute to talk about conservative forces. Uh, conservative forces are forces where only the beginning and end of a path matter. In other words, it only matters where we start and where we end, not what happens in between. Um, gravity, for example, is a conservative force. In other words, if I, you know, we take our example of an object and we had it lifting up five meters in the previous video. So if I take that object, my little white ball here, and it starts down here, and then I lift it up five meters, I've gained a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. Uh, in other words, I've done a certain amount of work on it to give it that energy. If I took this ball and I lift it over here and down here and make it go around in a couple circles and up here and still end at the same point, the amount of work I've done to get it from here down at the bottom up to the top is still the same amount. It took this much work to get it this high. So the beginning and end of my path didn't matter. It didn't matter where I went. It only mad mattered that I started here and that I ended five meters up above it. So that's what a conservative force is. So gravitational potential energy and gra uh, the force of gravity would be a conservative force. We talked about how gravitational potential energy was a, uh, or came from a conservative force. Elastic potential energy is another type of energy that comes from a conservative force, in this case spring energy and spring forces. So let's picture a spring like this, maybe with an object at the end. And if we take that spring and we compress it, so that maybe now it's only this long, we have some amount of energy that is stored in this spring here, right? If we let go of it, all of a sudden it would go shooting off uh, and it would have uh, kinetic energy. So we're storing potential energy within this spring, and that, is, that potential energy comes from a conservative force, a spring force. The equation for elastic potential energy, or sometimes called spring potential energy, so I'll abbreviate with a little s there for spring potential, is 1 half kx squared. This x here is the distance that we either compress or expand a spring, or maybe stretch the spring out. So this is the distance we either stretch or compress the spring. k here is a, a, what's called the spring constant. Okay, our spring constant is something that's very important. Uh, it kind of gives us a measure of how strong our spring is, right? Different springs have different strengths. If you compare, you know, the spring in your little mechanical pencil to, say, the springs that are in the shocks of a car, there's a big difference in how strong those springs are and how easy it is to stretch or compress those springs. So the spring constant is unique to each spring and kind of gives us an idea of how strong that spring is. Uh, it's a number that's usually in the hundreds of newtons per meter is the unit for it. So anytime you see something that's newtons per meter, we're talking about a spring constant there. Because it's an energy, again, we're going to come out in units of joules. So potential spring energy, it comes out in joules, just like gravitational potential energy, just like kinetic energy. So we're going to talk about conservation of mechanical energy. What this tells us is that the total mechanical energy in any system remains constant. And we should be clear here and say that we're talking in any conservative system, right? any system where we're dealing with just conservative forces like we've talked about so far. Equation-wise, it looks like this. We would have kinetic energy, whatever our total kinetic energy is, plus our total potential energy is going to remain constant. Okay, And remember that potential energy could come from either spring or gravitational energy, and kinetic energy is our energy of motion, or one half mv squared. Another probably more useful way to write this is kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. So maybe a, a quick example of how this might work is if you can picture a, a roller coaster track. Yeah, let's say we go up and down low and we come up and maybe go around a loop and go down. And we have our roller coaster there that's going to go over this track. So we'll get our roller coaster here. We'll have it start down here. And that roller coaster is going to slowly be pulled up this ramp. 
So work is being done to lift it. And once that work has been done to lift it up the ramp, it has some amount of gravitational potential energy up at the top. Uh, let's say, for example, it has 10 joules, just for a nice easy number to work with. Then, as our roller coaster goes down the ramp, and let's say it gets to the point where now it's at the very bottom of the ramp here. So here's our roller coaster down here near the bottom of the ramp. All of that gravitational potential energy, as it goes down here, gets transferred to kinetic energy, right? It starts to speed up, it gains velocity. So here we have our maximum amount of kinetic energy, and that would be equal to 10 joules, because down here where height is zero, I have no potential energy, right? MGH, if H is zero, then I have no potential energy. So my 10 joules of potential energy up at the top got transferred down to kinetic energy at the bottom, and then our roller coaster now it goes up through our loop, and so let's say now it's up here at the top of the loop, and now when our roller coaster is at the top of the loop, let's say, because we're not quite back at the same height we started with, so I'm not going to have 10 joules of potential energy, let's say that potential energy up here, maybe I only have 3 joules of gravitational potential energy, and well, to keep conservation of energy true, that would mean I need 7 joules of kinetic energy there. And then just for fun, let's throw a spring in. And let's say there's a spring at the end here that brings our roller coaster to a stop. So once our roller coaster comes to a stop and it compresses the spring, all of that energy now will be in spring potential energy, and I will also have 10 joules of spring potential energy. So that 10 joules that we initially started with that we got from the work done by what was lifting the roller coaster, gets transferred to kinetic energy, gets some of it gets transferred back to potential energy, and back around, and then hits the spring, and then it all gets stored in the spring again. So we see everywhere 10 joules, 10 joules, a total of 10 joules, 10 joules. So it's constant everywhere. We didn't lose any energy anywhere. That's what conservation of mechanical energy is. So it helps us solve problems because I could substitute in say one half mb squared and mgh for these and I can actually solve for useful things like how fast was it going at the bottom or uh, what height can it get to if I, it started at a certain speed. So we talked at the beginning about conservative forces so now we want to look at non-conservative forces. One really good example of a non-conservative force is our force of friction. Okay. Remember, a non-conservative force by de or conservative force by definition, the path over which something traveled didn't matter. Okay, it matters with non-conservative forces. Right. So, for example, the work done by friction or the force of friction is going to change depending on the path that I travel. Right. So, if I just draw a very simple path here, just very straight, and we take our object. and our object moves across this path, there was some work done by friction, and that energy was lost as thermal energy. So energy lost, we could say, to heat. All right? You know this because if you rub your hands together, your hands warm up, right? Friction causes heat. So that's one way that we can kind of lose energy or take energy out of a system is through heat. Let's compare that now to a different path. Let's say I take a path that does this. Notice it's a much longer path. So if I take my object here, and now I move it along this path, remember I'm losing a little bit of heat and a little bit of heat and a little bit of heat every time I'm making contact with the surface. So through this entire path, I'm losing more heat. Well, which path did I lose more heat to? I lost heat to the more heat, more energy to the long path. So the total amount of energy I'm left with, let's say, you know, in, in the form of kinetic energy, I'd have much more kinetic energy at the end of this path than I would at this path if we started with the same amount of energy. Because here, I've lost much more energy to friction, much more energy to heat. So the length of the path, path matters with friction because the longer my path is, the more energy I'm going to lose. So what we're going to have to figure out at some point is how can we factor in these non-conservative forces into a conservation of energy equation that will help us out.